think I had a I had a long discussion with the director how to to go about this film because it was um, it was a film that had a lot of space for music, so we knew that the music had to play uh, a big role. And uh, I was looking for inspiration, something that that reminded me about nature, something that uh, that somehow had a tone that that could lead to a music that for me was about the Nordic landscape where, where the film takes place. And I was looking uh, I was looking into my background as a composer where I've been studying in Russia, uh, with St. Petersburg, uh, old masters like the school of Rumsky, Korsakov, uh, Mussorgsky, Shostakovich and so on. And, and also especially the music of Sibelius, uh, which I thought had this sort of dark mellow tone where you use the, the deep strings and, and the deep woodwinds a lot and somehow for me that was uh, that was the starting point for the for the timbre of the score in the film we have the great bear that is um, sort of the I mean it, it's the title of the film and it's, it's, it's really the main character and um, the director is portraying this this beast, so to speak, in a way where, depending on from whose point of view you look at, upon it, it can be either a teddy bear that, that the little girl has a very intimate relationship with and is not afraid of at all, or it can be a wild beast that, that must be slaughtered by, by the hunter. And uh, this sort of duality, that, that the same thing can be either good or bad, uh, I was trying to, to portray in the, in the harmony treatment uh, of the score where I use a um, uh, a B minor uh, chord that has the tone D as the third, and and a B flat major that has also the tone D. So you, if you keep the same tone and you just change the fifths around it, you go from a mellow minor to a clear major, and within a very sort of small uh, twitch of, of the of the arm, you can go from one mood to the other. And actually, in most of the, of the of the pieces in in the film, I use that that mood. To, to, to have this sort of duality portrayed in the music. I guess you can say that, that there's a trend at the moment in, in Hollywood films, for example, that the woodwinds are used quite rarely. I mean, you see some, some very big scores, but they're, they're sort of, they're born with, with the strings and especially the brass and the percussion as the sort of main timbres in, in, in the orchestra. And I felt that if you use the woodwind, especially the the lesser used uh, part, like, like for example, the bassoon, uh, you would have s a chance of creating something that would sound fresh to, to the audience somehow, and, and also a bit more sort of out of Hollywood, but still have potential of being dramatic and big. Uh, and I think I used the, the bassoon soloist as, as my sort of main instrument in this film, uh, and it, I think it really suits the, the forest and the, the Nordic nature quite well. I think when, when you when you work on a film for let's say almost a year, and and you you're looking for something that that wasn't there before, um, the creative process sometimes takes you in, and then you you if you're presented with what you have created in in the end in the beginning, you just say this is this is this is rubbish or what is this? But um, I mean in this film, for example, I, I had. I think I've written almost twice as much music as ended up in the film because I was also temping the film, um, and I had some ideas about what to do with the music that also the director influenced on, and and I think together with him we ended up in a completely different place than both of us had actually imagined to begin with, um, and I think especially also because at mid midway through I knew that we were going to record with the Danish National Symphony Orchestra. And that actually made my creative process quite, quite different because I, I then I knew specifically who was going to play the music. I, I knew they had these and these solos. I knew I could I could definitely achieve this if I if I wrote for this instrument and so on. So that was actually a great uh, catalyst catalyst for for the work uh, throughout the, the film. I think there's a, there's a very huge difference between animation movies and, and uh, live action movies especially in the way that, that the production uh, period is much longer. 
when it comes to animation movies, um, and you have much more control on what is going on. And actually, for a very long period of time, you don't have a final picture, so you don't really see what the movie looks like. So you have to use your imagination uh, to quite a large uh, extent. And in the, this, this movie, it was quite extreme because I didn't get the, the final picture almost ever. I mean, I was I was seeing it in the cinema. Uh, how it was really like the final polished uh, picture with all the with the light and everything. So uh, that was a bit of a of a challenge. Um, but of course, I mean, when it comes to animation movies, you 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 can sort of allow yourself much more, I think, than than in a conventional uh, film because um, I mean, it all stems from from Disney and from from the way that that we we s we look upon animation movies. I mean, uh, nobody sort of uh, is surprised if something crazy happens in the music that would in a normal film seem completely out of place but but you have a much large larger scope of, of tools available that you can just apply with no excuse and I kind of think that that's that's, that's a nice way of, of going about it that, that you can just go for something if you feel like it uh, and and the audience and the director and, and everyone will just think it, it's fine uh, but of course, you have to to set some some sort of rules for what you do, and and, and make it have its own logic within within the scope of the film.